Hello and welcome to the Roker Report podcast in association with Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen. My name's Philip West and it's been yet another eventful week for Sunderland AFC, but this time it's been in the most positive sense of the word. So we decided to record a podcast to talk about what's been happening and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Gav Henderson. How are you, Gav? Very good, Phil. Thanks. I'm uh, looking forward to the week ahead. We've got lots coming up with Sunderland. Absolutely, we do. And I'm also joined by Rich Spade. How are you this morning, Rich? I'm good, yeah, thanks. Had a decent week, excited. Got the Euros starting next week, the women's football, yeah. so it's a exciting time, especially with all the incomings at Sunderland Football Club. It's brilliant. Well, that, that's that, that's a good place to start because obviously, obviously in the wake of the fixtures being released last week, contracts were very much the order of the day. And we might as well start with talking about our new signing, Daniel Ballard, who arrived yesterday from Arsenal via Millwall, a loan spell at Millwall. Starting with you, Gav, um, do you think this is an exciting signing? Because he seems to fit the template that we're working off at the moment with the young development players, bringing them through, players with potential, etc., etc. Do you think this uh, fits that bill quite nicely? Oh, absolutely. I mean, age, profile, pedigree, all, all fits, doesn't it? We've been looking at um, the best young players who are just sitting outside of the sort of the first 18, 20 of top Premier League squads over the last couple of years, haven't we? And I know we picked up Dennis Serkin, we picked up um, Niall Huggins, who obviously hasn't had a great spell so far due to injury. Uh, but Ballard, yeah, definitely fits the bill. I think the, the important thing for me was that we... I've been saying this quite a lot. Whatever money we do have, we have to use it wisely. And obviously this lad was very highly thought of. He nearly signed for Burnley last week. And... For whatever reason, that broke down. I think it was mooted that something to do with the terms of the deal didn't work out. And he'd already had his medical and Grady's personal terms and it just didn't happen. But Burnley had just been relegated from the Premier League. Mm -hmm. Burnley have got probably the greatest centre-half of the what the last 10 years in the Premier League managing them now. And he fought enough of Ballard to try and sign him. Yeah. So <clears throat> to me, that, that tells me that he's, he's got everything we need. I think I listened to his interview on the site like the club did with him and he, he spoke about how he feels like he's a, he's an old-fashioned centre-half but the Millwall fan that we spoke to uh, on the website which people can catch if they read back a few days there's, there's an interview with a Millwall fan uh, just talking about Ballard they said that his passing's very good which you'd expect for anybody coming out of the Arsenal Academy really wouldn't you You know, mm. so I, I'm over the moon I think I think it's although I haven't seen him um, since he played for Blackpool against Sunderland um, I don't know. It just feels right, doesn't it? Yeah. It's quite often we sign players and you're not sure, but this one just feels right. Rich, just turning this to you, and obviously he comes with some impressive credentials. Um, a twice two-time captain of an Arsenal team that got to the FA Youth Cup final. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed yesterday was the statement that he said when he when he was uh, first announced was supporters can expect to see a player who loves defending and tackling. That to me says like he feels like he's quite a confident player for such a young guy. Do you think that's encouraging? I think it's great. I think you look at the amount of experience he's actually built up for what a twenty-year-old, um, having played, you know, senior football for the last couple of years, uh, had success, played at a, a decent level, obviously in the championship, and and you look at his stats. I think there was um, some stats put out yesterday, and he's in the kind of the 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 top quartile of of defenders in the in the championship last season um in most in most respects and obviously he's got development to 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 come he's a he's a full international at that age again um I know it's Northern Ireland and they don't have a great pool of players but um you know obviously we have, we have half of them Rich, what you talking well about? exactly exactly <laughs> most of them do play for us these days yeah. but um you know he's um He's got pedigree and, like you say, about coming through at Arsenal's academy, I think that's a really um, a really good sign. Um, what what really my thoughts on it were is it's it's a next level signing um, compared to the, the similar kind of deals that were done last summer, uh, which were for players who maybe hadn't had first team senior experience um, or hadn't had too much, even... Uh, Nathan Broadhead only had a handful of uh, appearances uh, in his first loan spell, uh, and this is a this is a player who comes with um, a bank of games under his belt, um, so it isn't learning his trade at Sunderland necessarily um, this time round. He's come to be come to be a performer. Yeah, I mean, like like I said, he's twenty, and so I think you know we, we've we've got to give him the same the same level of kind of. Um, Slack as as any twenty year old because any 
twenty year old young man is going to make mistakes and 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 still have a lot of developing to do. Um, but I think we've we've got a really good one there, and and it's a it's it's credit to the club that they are able to attract that caliber of, of footballer. Absolutely, I'm interested to see where he fits in because mm-hmm. yes. we've obviously. We established a pretty solid partnership towards the end of the season with Bailey Wright and Danny Bart. Bailey Wright's obviously just signed a new deal. I yeah. think he's 29, Dan, uh, Danny Bart's 31. And the Millwall fan that we spoke to told us that he traditionally played in their side on the right of a three, which makes me wonder what the what the sort of sketch is going to be next season. But the profile of him makes me think that he's probably going to play in a two. Mm-hmm. Big, mm-hmm. imposing, good on the ball, good in the air, a good tackler. I mean, you you tend to play a three to cover the weaknesses of other players in the defence, don't you? Yeah. And and that, that'll be interesting to see where we go in terms of recruiting the rest of the window because we all know that we probably need need to add quality in the fullback areas and we've got to see some sort of progress in that regard. I think if the if there's one one place in the team where I'm a little bit worried about the strength and depth, it's at left back and right back. And obviously going off that left wing back and right wing back, so I'm interested to see where this takes us because I think Alex Neal last season, he played a back three quite a lot, but it was more down to the players he had. And we're going to see, yeah. obviously, in the pre-season games, aren't we, what sort of system he plays and what systems he, he flits between. But, yeah, I, I, I'd like to think that we're going to go with the two at the back and hopefully that means um, maybe a, a right-back coming in. Possibly. Uh, yeah, Rich Allen, so you raise your hand there. It's just a thought on that. Um, we've seen... In the you know the latter part of last season, that Alex Neil will play horses for courses, and maybe you know having that competition for two, you know, uh, three front line centre backs going for two positions in in a four um, means that he's able to to pick and choose, and if he needs a real real experienced battering ram against a, a, a team that we 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 might you know be subject to getting. Uh, uh, been under a lot of pressure. Then maybe it's Danny Bar, and maybe if if we if we are going to have more time on the ball, or he expects us to to play out from the back a bit more against a, a side that we're looking to break down, then 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 maybe it's it's going to be Ballard. So I think there's a, um, a a range of options, and I think that's what we need across all positions. Um, Gav just mentioned left back and right back, and I, I have to agree there. But um, I think. A real priority has to be in the in the forward area. At the minute, we've got one centre forward at the club, or one senior centre yeah. forward at the club, and 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 if there's an area where I'm not nervous about, because obviously there's still a good few weeks and and two months left in the in the transfer window, but um, I don't want us to be going into next season uh, with 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 limited options in the forward areas, because I think in in this division you need multiple players who can score goals and, and we did rely on Ross Stewart um, and and Broadhead obviously and we're not sure about what's going to happen with him. Yeah. Uh, I think we I think we need that strength and depth up front and so I'd be really interested to see what they do in that position. Yeah. So just just before we move on, obviously just discussing Ballard there and obviously he's given us a good option there in defence. Um just turning to you Gav on this. Obviously with the likes of Tri Hume and Niall Huggins potentially coming back into the equation this season, hopefully, given a good pre-season, hopefully they should be fit and firing. How do you think the defence is shaping up at the moment in terms of depth? You mentioned we need some more full-backs. Um, do you think that should be one of the top priorities or do you think that could be maybe addressed a little bit later on down the line? Um, I, th- I think what you've got to think about is we've lost quite a lot of players. So yes, I know I know Willis didn't play really for two years, but we've lost him. We've lost RB Jamadjli. Um We've got we've got to fill in those positions with better players. So I think we still need another centre half. I wouldn't be going into the season with just three of them, particularly since last season we played three at the back quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously we lost Callum Doyle as well. I think you're right though. I think the one the one thing is that we we can probably afford to wait a little bit now for another defender to come along. Um, we've been very calculated, haven't we, with the way that we recruit players. We're not in a rush to sign anybody. And the other the other thing that people tend to overlook when they're talking about oh Sutton should sign this player, Sutton should sign that player, <clears throat> is that these Premier League teams in, in particular, they've got big squads, but for one, <laughs> the players who've been on international duty 
they're probably only just either coming back this week or coming back next week into training. Um, they haven't got their squads filled, so they're not going to let players go until their players come in. It's There's a domino effect that happened yet, and it still hasn't happened. With yeah. Ballard, we've been lucky because quite clearly Arsenal were never going to keep him to play as part of the first team. So it was likely at the end of last season he'll have discussed with Arteta at Arsenal and they'll have agreed that he, he would be allowed to leave. Um, whereas with, with other players, depending on their own individual situation... They're going to be expected to play their part in pre-season for their teams, even if they're not part of the plans for next season. That's just the way it is. It's going to be the same for Sunderland on a lesser degree. We're going to probably use players like Jack Diamond, who might go back out on loan. You mentioned Hume there. I don't think Hume will be part of the first team this season. I think they'll loan him out. Yeah. He needs to go probably to the top end of League One and play 30, 40 games this season. Um, so at the minute, obviously I'm not content, but I, I'm what I am content with is waiting because... We did it last year. Everybody panicked. You know, Ipswich, if you remember last year, Ipswich were the team in League One who signed up loads of players really early in the window. They finished 11th. We got promoted. Yeah. And everybody was panicking because they were signing players. They were signing, I think they signed um, Scott Fraser, didn't they? Um, uh, Macaulay Bond players. They sent, they sent some really good players for League One, but ultimately it didn't work out for them. And the point what I, what I would make off the back of that is that Ultimately, it's not about getting your players in early, like Cardiff have in this window, by the way. I think Cardiff have signed eight or nine players in our league. But I looked at the players have signed, and there's probably only one of them that I would take at Sunderland, and that's Marlon Romeo. The rest of them are very average players who probably at this stage in the transfer window were just desperate to get going, desperate to get into pre-season early, happy enough to sign for a club like Cardiff. But we're, we're looking for a calibre above that. We're looking at players who, all right, they might not be available right now, but give it three, four even five weeks and I know people want them in early but give it that amount of time these players will become available to us and I'm I'm happy to wait yeah yeah I think sorry Rich you wanted to pick up on Gavin's point there yeah it's it's the point about the caliber of players that we're looking at um and it was a point that Ballard actually raised in his uh interview with the club uh, that came out yesterday which was that you know he was really impressed with the facilities and the setup at Sunderland, he called us a Premier League club, essentially, and I think I think we need to keep playing on that as a as a as a fan base as well. You know, not get despondent when a a player from League One moves to another Championship club who we, who we you know the, there's a possibility we might want to pick up because he might have had a decent game against us last last season or whatever. Clearly, the recruitment plan is, as was mentioned earlier, to pick off you know. The, the players who were who were looking to move their careers on from Premier League academies and maybe elsewhere in Europe as well, like we did last season too, uh, as well as picking up you know the the real diamonds from League One, like we did with Matete, who who I think actually will be a, a really big player for us this season uh, as he develops, and we've even announced a new a new partnership with a new data company this week that's going to even further improve that as well so it's just like keeping in mind that we are you know the biggest club in the EFL like we have been for the past four years anyway but now we're in the championship and we're able to compete for those footballers who you know might Ballard you could have seen going to the bottom end of the the Premier League you know a Brighton or somebody like that could have picked him up and it shows intent and I think it could unlock some other deals because if you're if you're another if you're another player of a similar ilk to Ballard and you see him making that transfer and what he said about the club, it's only going to work in our favour when it comes to kind of attracting that level of footballer. Absolutely, yeah. I'll cut in on that, Richard. The point you make about the, the facilities is bang on. That's our USP, isn't it? Really, like yeah. And we've got that over every club in this league. One thing we do have, particularly for these players who, let's be honest, the They've had a good upbringing in football, so yeah. they've they've only ever known an, an elite performance background. Fantastic academy facilities, the best coaches. You know, Sunderland have got all of that. We've had that, you know, for God knows how many years. We're a Cat One Academy, so when these players are making the the move, and it's a, you've got to think for a young player when you're like uh, Ballard. You, you, I don't I don't know him particularly well, so I don't know if he this is the way he thinks, but. He's obviously had a couple of loan moves and Brighton and Millwall are very different to Arsenal. But 
when you're making that big decision in your life to this this is his first proper move in his career. We've got we've got proper facilities to offer these players, and that's huge. If you know that you're not just going to some two bit football club who, you know, where you you have an ice bath and a paddling pool outside and things like that. You know what I mean? I mean, I know he touched mm. he touched on his interview as well, didn't he? Um, about how obviously he already knows a few of the lads from the Northern Ireland setup. I think he name checked Corey Evans in particular, and he mentioned Elliot Embleton, of course, who was his best mate at Blackpool. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's it. Straight away, he's coming into the club. He already knows people. He doesn't have that uh, harsh settling in period that a lot of players might have. And really, it gives them the platform to hit the ground running, doesn't it? There's no Absolutely. reason why Ballard shouldn't come in and and you know play straight away. I know a few people were wondering where he fits and is he going to be a starter. I don't think there's any doubt he's come here to start games. I know how much people love Bailey Wright. Um, and I know Danny Bart really impressed us towards the end of the season, but this kid's come from a little bit of a higher standard and has come here for good money. So you would expect him to play from the off. And the fact that Sunderland can give him so much more than a lot of clubs at this level is huge. And it'll be huge for the rest of the window when we're trying to sign players of similar ilk. You know, Absolutely. we've got we've got to really play on that as our USP. Yeah. So if we're just moving on a little bit, obviously it's great to have Ballard on board and hopefully he can make a really big impact this season. Um, renewed contracts this week as well for Anthony Patterson, Lyndon Gooch and of course Patrick Roberts as well and Bailey Wright. Um, just throwing this to you, Rich, I was absolutely elated that all those lads were given new contracts because I think they'll play a really big part this coming season under Alex Neil. They're all favourites of him, obviously. Do you think that's um, obviously a positive development tying down the futures of those players who were all key, um, of course, during the playoff run? I think it's undoubtedly a, a good thing. Any championship club would have been happy to have any of those players in their squad for the coming season, you know, even at, at the top end. And, you know, we've got experienced international in, in Bailey Wright. We've got Lyndon Gooch, who's obviously a, a brilliant servant of the club and can, you know, when you're talking about a, a, a long championship season, grueling championship season, he's, he's somebody who is able to play in multiple positions and and will always give his all. And obviously with Patterson, you, what we've done there is retain the value that we've built up over the past, um, however long he's been at the club through the academy. You know, we've invested a lot of money into him and we're going to continue to do that with the new contract. It may well be that you know if he if he keeps his place as the first choice, that come next summer if we're still in the championship, then it might be that bigger things come calling for for Patterson because the, his rate of development over the over the past year has been absolutely phenomenal to see. So retaining that value, I think, is 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 a massive thing. Um, and Roberts, I mean, I have to say, I think that was the one I was most excited about because. I wouldn't have wanted to come up against him this season at all. I think he's he's got loads more to offer. I think now he's got a, a permanent long-term or longer-term contract. We'll see those flashes of brilliance be more regular. Yeah. You know, he might even might even add the uh, the finishing touches more often. Obviously, got us through the, the the playoff semis, but there were so many times at the end of last season where you thought, you know, there's goals. There's goals in this lad, and he just, just keeps hitting the goalkeeper's gloves rather than sticking it either side of him. Um, I think he's going to be huge, and actually, I think it probably something we'll talk about in a bit. He's exactly the kind of player who we need. He's he's so exciting, and he's got that that youth on his side. He's not a, he's not a kid, but he's got you know a lot of years left in him. Yes, and again, it's just the kind of the value that we've got from that deal is is class because. You know, if you were to try and buy a player like him on the open market, you'd be you'd be paying millions, to be honest. Just throwing this to you, Gav, because uh, you wrote a piece on the Roker Report, which people can still read if you just go onto the website and scroll down. Um, I know you've spoken very, very highly about Patrick Roberts, Gav, and I just wanted to ask you, obviously, if you looked at his career before he came to Sunderland, he'd had a bit of a wandering career, really, with loan spells here, there, and everywhere. Celtic was arguably the place where he made his biggest impact. Yeah. Do you think that he is the kind of player who can really find what you would call a footballing home at Sunderland? Do you think he can really settle down here, put roots down on Wearside and enjoy maybe a four, five, six year career at the club if everything goes well for him? Yeah, I think he's a prime example of the farming that top clubs do with young talent. 
Yes. And and just holding on to players and, and making their careers stagnate effectively. You know, Patrick Roberts as a 17-year-old making his Premier League debut for Fulham shouldn't have had to wait seven years to then find a football club where he can play properly and that's his club. I think that's wrong. He's one example of many, though, isn't he? Chelsea and, and Man City are the biggest defenders in English football for where they, they hold on to these players and don't let them go. I, I think his career to this point, you've got to be, you've got to be honest, it, he's been held back. Went to Celtic and had two very good years with Celtic. And, and after that, really, it's been a bit stop-start. He's played yeah. for... I think he went to Norwich on loan and it, when they were in the Premier League and didn't play at all. I think he got three, three games all season. That's not helping at all, is it? And then you, know, you sort of move on from there. Um, he played for Girona in, in La Liga, where he had a decent enough spell. Played for Middlesbrough twice, I think. So... And then obviously before he came to us, he went on loan. Didn't play at all. Like was in the second team towards the end of his spell. Obviously a total nightmare of a transfer. And that's where we got ahead of the pack, I guess. Because I think Patrick Roberts, if I remember rightly, when he signed for Sunderland, it was said that there were championship clubs interested, but Sunderland had, Sunderland had managed to pip them based on what they were selling to him. And we've really, we've, we've really what we've done is, in this similar goes for Alex Pritchard, we've rebuilt him as a player over the last sort of six months or so so he's he came in with zero match fitness pro- probably very little in the way of, of confidence and motivation to play as you'd expect if you're not kicking a ball you know doing what you love so he came here it took a little while to get up to speed let's be honest you know and that was always going to be the case so we, we, we took our time with him but by the time that he was ready to make an impact on the team he did particularly towards the end of the season where we saw it in the two playoff games uh, against Sheffield Wednesday and then in the final where he was arguably man the match other, other than for Pritchard. So I think what that does is it, it shows that this is a this is a footballer who is capable of a lot more. I think the fact that he his pedigree is of a player who should probably, had he not been held back so much at Man City, be playing in the Premier League, bodes very well for us. We've got to, we've got to now back ourselves with him to make him find that within him again, that that footballer who, you know, burst onto the scene as a seventeen-year-old and then had two good years with Celtic, we need to find that version of Pat Roberts again. If we do, I think this could be, and I wrote about this. I think this could be the best bit of business or some of the best business in the championship because he yeah. is that good. And I think people are going to underestimate him based on the fact that he's had a couple of bad years of loan spells where he he struggled to get into teams and stuff, and you know. Probably made the wrong move a couple of times. You look at Middlesbrough, for instance. I think Neil Warnock was his manager. He's not a Neil Warnock player, you know. Never. No, he's not. So you've got you've got to take all of these things into account. You can't make too many excuses. But I think one thing we saw with Patrick Roberts was that he he realised the the opportunity that he had playing for Sunderland, and that's why he came to League One. He backed himself to get this team out of the league, as did a number of other players and the manager. And now we're in the Championship. I think he is a, a player who comfortably would fit in any other team in the league. Yeah. And I think Rich is right. If he can just find his scoring boots, get a few more assists, he's going to be a, a, a game changer for us. And how often do those type of players come around for newly promoted sides? I would say not very often. Yeah, it's, it's, it, is a, it, is a, it is a rare occurrence. Just wanted to turn to you, Rich, um, on a point about Bailey Wright now. Um, obviously, retaining his services. Do you think that his leadership... Uh, skills, which he's obviously got in abundance. Do you think they could be really crucial for us this season? Because you know it will be a battle in in the championship a lot of times. You know there will be moments where we've got a we've got a really you know grind it out and, and stand strong. And he strikes me as a real what you might call an Alex Neil type player with his qualities. You know he's physically rugged. He's he's a good leader. He's an organizer. Do you think he will be a a, a key player for us this coming season as well? Yeah, I think you need leaders. In every area of the pitch, obviously you can have your kind of mercurial talents, maybe on on the on the wings or or in in attacking midfielder positions where they can just get on and 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 play their game. But you need a leader in every area. I think that kind of leadership quality is something that you're right, Alex Neil really values. Um, he sees it reflected in people like Bailey Wright and people like Corey Evans, even uh, people like Alex Pritchard, actually, who who do, shows leadership on the field, shows his experience and shows his quality. With Wright, he seems to have been rejuvenated to a certain extent. He's regained his place in the Australian setup. He'll be going to the World Cup. All of these things are, are really important, actually, for a 
for a player because there was an element where with Wright, you could always see that there was a player who was probably playing slightly below his level there, but it was whether he could, whether he had the confidence, actually. Because, you know, as much as he's a kind of, you know, he's a big strapping Aussie bloke and that, um, he did look a little bit down on confidence at times. And, and obviously his injuries were something that really held him back to begin with, you know, in the first couple of years, really, at, at the club. So I do I do think he's an important leader, both on the pitch, but but off the pitch as well. And he seems to be somebody who's quite popular with the, the rest of the, the dressing room. Um, seems to have a laugh with people as well, but have that has that real professionalism of somebody who is obviously an international footballer, um, a championship level, at least championship level player uh, by pedigree. So I, I just think he's, he's almost like he's the typical Sunderland player in this squad in that he's got um, bags of potential, even though he's, you know, he's, he's, he's 30, he's probably still improving. And I think we saw that over the, again, the latter half of the season. It just goes to show as well, like what a, a manager with really high standards can, can get out of a player as well. Uh, and, and, I think, you know, as much as Lee Johnson, you know, had us playing nice football and that, I think the 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 expectations that Alex Neil brought has brought to the to the club. Um that that comment uh Gav made before about how um it looked like Roberts wanted to take us to the championship, you know, and, and Alex Neil was along that. I think Wright was definitely in that mould as well, that like he saw it as an, the opportunity. And and I think you know the the more I talk about it, obviously you know you can hype each other up but I think we're going to be pretty much all right in the championship with players like Wright um, at the core of it even if he's not always on the pitch because as we talked about you know Ballard is maybe playing in that similar kind of right centre back position he's going to be absolutely crucial yeah absolutely and um, Gav just wanted to throw a uh, question to you about Alex Neil actually Rich has mm-hmm. uh, rather neatly uh, brought that up and. Um, Obviously, when he when towards the end of last season, when we were embarking on that playoff run, Alex Neil's mantra to the players seemed to be, you know, no fear, you can't change the past, but you can write your own future story. And then the way we played in the playoff final just it, it made it look like a really, really easy game for us. And um, as we as we move closer to the season starting, he, it seems to me that he will be absolutely relishing the challenge of leading Sunderland into a championship campaign, and then maybe long term even leading the back of the Premiership. Do you have a hundred percent trust in Alex Neil that he will approach this season with absolutely no fear whatsoever? I don't. I don't have any doubt about that whatsoever. I don't think the man fears anything. I think if you if you stood a, a T Rex in front of Alex Neil, he'd rip its head off, wouldn't he? He's, he's just the, the man has no fear for anything. I don't think he's worried about this league at all. He's got plenty of experience at this level, which is important. Um, I listened to a really good podcast a couple of days ago from uh, Second Tier Pod, which is. A new one for our fans to get familiar with, I guess, now that we're moving up the leagues. They cover the championship extensively. And um, they ranked each manager from the 24 teams for the new season, uh, you know, sort of 1 to 24. And they, they placed Alex Neil around 8th, and one of the guys on the show actually wanted him a lot higher, but they couldn't have they couldn't have spoke better about Alex Neil and sort of the job, not only that he's done at Sunderland, but what he did with, with Preston and then Norwich before that. And... It was interesting hearing them say that the feeling was that when he was at Preston, he just wasn't backed with, with the money. So he had them on the precipice of the playoffs um, about to sort of break in and potentially even mount a promotion campaign without having the funds to necessarily be able to do what he wanted to do. Um, at Sunderland, he's obviously going to have a lot better resources. He might not have a, a an endless sum of money to spend on players, but what what has been well established is that we will bring in good enough players, quality players, players who have the room to improve and become Premier League players down the line. And I think for a manager that that's got to be a huge positive. So you combine that with his sort of never say a die attitude, high standards, as Rich said. Um, I don't think there's any way that he will fear any teams in this league. He'll be very realistic. Yeah. I think he has been. I think he knows that we aren't just going to come into the league. Into the into the championship and, and walk all over teams, but I think you've got to have the right mentality coming into this level. Like look at Peterborough last season; they 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 done very well in League One, and they tried to play the same way when they got promoted without really 
bringing in good enough players effectively and they struggled right throughout the season and they ended up sacking their manager and, and all the rest of it and comparatively we are a massive club compared to Peterborough but one thing I do think is that we won't we won't be that naive we won't come into the championship and try and play a certain style of football against certain teams that if you do that you're going to get exposed I think yeah. Alex Neal has set us up to be rigid and solid and although that you know you, you do have that base we've got the players in attack with the quality to take any team apart I Absolutely. can't remember if you can't remember who it was who said it. It might have been Max Power when he was on our podcast, but he said that he felt our front four. I think it was Max Power said that he felt our front four would um, cause problems for any team, even in this league. And that's the key, isn't it? That I have no doubt that the manager's got the right mentality. The players will have the right mentality off the back of that. The base that we perform from defensively will be very solid. It's about whether we keep those players in the attack fit and firing. And um, and ultimately stave off any interest as well for them from other clubs and yeah I think we've just got a really good manager here and I've got no doubt that we're in the we're in the best place possible getting promoted. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I know Rich mentioned this earlier on in the podcast that Alex Neal is very much a kind of a horses for courses manager who mm. will rotate his personnel to fit any given game, and I think that's going to be key for us next season. You know, we saw that towards the end of last season how. He would change things depending on who we were playing, and he showed that kind of adaptability and that that ability to kind of you know change things as and when was needed. So I I agree with you, Gav. I think it's going to be absolutely crucial for us next season. Just wanted to move on to another topic now because obviously we've talked a lot about incomings um, and contract renewals. Uh, a departure this week. David Priest uh, left the club. Uh, just wanted to start with you on this one, Rich, because he did seem to be a quite a, a quite highly regarded figure um, within the club. Were you surprised to see him go? Sad to see him leave? How did you feel about it? You know what? I was surprised because uh, he was kind of uh, ever present on the touchline uh, under Alex Neil, um, which for a goalkeeping coach isn't always the case. You know, he was always in the background shouting out instructions. Um, he's, uh, he's, by all accounts, from everything I've heard from him, listen to a couple of podcasts with him, he's a, he's a, a top bloke, proper proper normal Sunderland lad who you can imagine kind of getting on with quite well, going to gigs with and that and all that. Um so I I I found I, I thought it was it was strange. Maybe, you know, he's got other ideas about his career. He's got, you know, a lot of experience in Scandinavia. Um but he's he's I I always saw him as as a kind of a progressive voice in the dressing room, somebody with ideas, somebody someone who Kind of embraced new ways of working. Uh, worked with the women's team as well as men's team. I have to say, it came a little bit out of the blue because I thought he would be integral. Um, and he's obviously somebody who's worked closely with Anthony Patterson and has been integral for kind of his development coming back into the side in in the latter half of last season. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's got. Bigger and better things lined up, and uh, and and we'll see, and we'll see uh, as well who who Alex Neil wants to bring in as goalkeeping coach. It is the it is the case, obviously, that that David Priest was at the club before Alex Neil arrived, and and clearly a manager or a head coach wants to ensure that they've they've got the team of people that they know and they've worked with in in the past and they've got a, a, an established relationship with and there's probably a goalkeeping coach or two who Alex Neil wants to bring in what we know these days is that a a goalkeeper and actually the style of 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 a goalkeeper can be really important to the overall way in which a, a side plays, you know, playing out from the back or knowing when to clear it and and all these things. So I'm sure we'll find a replacement. But for for a local lad who's who's had a long association with the club and and a, and a good pedigree as a coach, I was shocked. I have to say. You say you want to expand on that? Yeah, guy? Rich was talking about finding a replacement. They've already really found one, haven't they? I think Mark Prudder was. Um, promoted wasn't he from academy right. goalkeeping coach up to first team and to me that makes a lot of sense he's been at the club for god knows how many years um, I think Jordan Pickford credits him with being probably the biggest influence on his career as a young player and then you look at Anthony Patterson well Prud has been his coach for many years so mm -hmm. it makes sense if the club are all in on on Patterson as a as a number one or you know 
all in in, in terms of developing him into a potentially a top goalkeeper that you keep whoever's the most influential coach at the club very close to him. So I'm I'm over the moon for Mark Prudder, to be fair. I think he's been at the club for for a long, long time and has never really been a feature of the of the first team. And maybe it's just the case that they've looked at it, they've seen, well, we've got this guy sort of on the precipice of the 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 outside of the of the first team setup who who is capable of doing a very good job. Why not give him a chance? And you know, I've got I've got um a lot of time for David Priest. I think it's it it's never nice to see somebody lose their job. But if it's just been decided, look, this is the best way to go, we've got to we, we feel like he's a better fit for the group. Um and that it's probably best that at the end of David's contract we let him go, then that's what they've done, you know. You know there's no real room for, I know it sounds it sounds a little harsh, but there's there's no real room for sentiment, is there you've got to, you've got to make whatever decision is best for the club, not the individual. Yep. Yeah. So, and I'm sure he'll be fine. I mean, before he came to Sunderland, he was prominent in the media, wasn't he? he was He was all over all the mm. sort of like the the main podcasts and and sports media outlets and stuff. And he can write. He's a good podcaster. I think he'd be fine if even if he even if it's just a stopgap and what you know until he finds another job in football. I'm sure he will. I think I think the fact that he um, played a part in Sunderland's promotion back to the championship will look very good on his CV, as will ultimately being a part of the development of a young goalkeeper who became our new number one. So yeah. I don't think that he'll struggle for work. I think he'll be fine. No, yeah. no. no, absolutely. And we hope uh, hope uh, Priest uh, goes on to bigger and better things. Um, just wanted to make one final point uh, on today's podcast, and that regards, or is regarding a transfer rumour. Uh, Fabio Barini has been linked with a move back to the stadium with light. This might, of course, just be fluff, typical off-season uh, filler, but... Uh, what do you think about it, Rich? Would you be wel- welcoming him back with open arms to the stadium with light, or is it another nostalgia trip? I mean, if he did sign, I'm sure he'd be very welcome, and I'm sure he'd fit. I don't actually. I don't know if he'd fill a hole in the squad. And this is my concern about it. it's not whether he was a you know former player, what level he's played at. I'm not sure we're um, really in the market for forward, right sided forward, attacking players. Well, I would disagree, Rich. I would disagree. I think I think be, we were talking about you. You you won't have seen this, but we were talking about this yesterday. And it, you've got to think like, how hard is it going to be to recruit a top striker who knows that ultimately Ross Stewart's number one and he plays as a one up front? Like it's difficult. Mm. And I think I think that what the club have probably got to do is they've got to sign players in that mold, like like Broadhead, so somebody who can play left, right, and up front, or as a ten. Mm. They've got yeah. to sign forwards who've probably got it in them to play a number of positions because ultimately you can't you can't get around the fact that Ross Stewart is the main man he plays best on his own and that he plays pretty much every game so when you're going out to sign players if you go and sign a I don't know another striker just like Ross Stewart like I've seen people on Twitter saying we maybe should have looked at Eves from Hull as a backup and I was thinking well he's not really played a Hull he wants to play first team football somewhere I've seen someone mention Michael Smith He's probably upped his money and went to Chef Wed, and he's going to play every week. Like we yeah. can't offer that to strikers. So regardless of whether it's Barini or anybody else, I actually think, to be honest, that the type of forward we're going to have to bring is probably that that kind of striker. But anyway, sorry, I put in on your point there about Barini. No, 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 I mean it's 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 a good point, and you know I did have an instinctive kind of reaction to the rumor of I've said a few times recently. I, if we if we uh, if we never talk about players who've, who've <laughs> played for Sunderland before, yeah, um, coming back to the club, I'll be happy well, because it's Jordan seems Henderson to be... and Jordan Pickford would be nice, though, wouldn't they? Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> well, yeah. I think I think they're the they, they're definitely yeah. they're definitely the exceptions yeah. uh, to the rule. But you know, we we broke with the the model and the plan with um, Jermaine Defoe. And all right, unique circumstances is considerably older than Barini is. He hardly played, etc. A different kind of player as well. But I, I am just maybe maybe we've just got that kind of like trauma from from January. I don't I don't want necessarily big name signings. I don't think big name signings work in the championship, as far as I can see from my uh, kind of rudimentary understanding of it it's not it's not the it's not the big names that get you playing well in this league it's the kind of the togetherness and having a almost a, a systematic way of playing 
that's derived from a, a recruitment model that's really well thought out. And I think we've got that. And I just wouldn't want us to be spe- expending a lot of the playing budget and a lot of time and energy as a fan base lobbying for a a move for a player who is he's come back once before and it, and it didn't necessarily work yeah. out. Yeah, so Gav. Yeah, I just want to echo what you're saying, really. I think that we get caught up in the in the nostalgia of these things, as we all well, most of us did with Defoe in January. Um and with Barini in particular, I'm I'm still a bit bitter about the way his last spell ended. And when you think about it like that <laughs> The first time he played for us, the the loan spell he had, fantastic. Like scored so many important goals, scored mm. in the cup final, scored vital goals in that great escape run, um, scored twice against Newcastle, of course. Like those are the things I want to remember him for. What I don't want to remember him for is him messing us around all summer, trying to retain his place at Liverpool instead of coming to Sunderland, and then when that didn't work out, coming back to us. But the club having to sort of give in to fan pressure in a, in a way and spending more than what he was worth on the fee and the wages to get him to come to Sunderland, it didn't work out. If you remember, um, there was the there was the incident between him and Sam Allardyce where he he came off the bench after not playing for quite a while and scored a really good goal against Crystal Palace and then it was a really important goal that got us the point in the game and he he ran straight to Allardyce to cel- celebrate in front of him. It just left a better, better taste in my mouth. And obviously on from that, we then had the David Moyes season where everybody tossed it off and he was part of that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure he does want to come back. That's probably because he hasn't got a great deal of good moves lined up. You know, he's 31-year-old. Yeah. He's had a bunch of bad moves around Europe in the last sort of three, four years since, even beyond that, probably since he left Sunderland. Uh, I think you've just got to move on. I'm sure he would love to come back and I'm sure there are fans who'd love to have him back. And like Rich said, I think if he did come back, he'd be very welcome. You know, we're not going to just, we're not going to tell him he's not welcome here. Yeah. But I just think the direction the club's going in, we, we it's nah, let's move on. Yeah. I think this was what, this was what I was partly averse to the Ravel Morrison uh, rumour for as well, because I think what we've got at the minute is a really good team spirit and a really set way of playing, you know, that is very much kind of trying to forward, be forward thinking. And I just think, you know, you're bringing these big name players like Barini, like Morrison, and I think there's a danger that you kind of upset that balance. But yeah, I, I just think I, I agree with what you were saying. You know, the, the danger is, of course, is that you, you run the risk of tarnishing the images from the, the players' previous spell at the club, like Defoe, for example. So yeah, I, I would be very surprised if there was anything in it. And, and personally, I would stay clear of it. But you never know. It, this well, it, could be crazy, it, and you just never know. It seems like. Some of it's been instigated from fans DM and his wife on Instagram. Yes, <laughs> you know, you know, there's been quite a lot of um, messages, screenshots of messages flying around of her saying, "Oh, we'd love to come back," and all this, that, and the other. I think, but ultimately, it was it's been marked, hasn't it? That and she said it herself that as much as he'd love it, the club aren't interested. So that should be yeah. the end of it, really. You know, yeah. like, we we can we can talk about it on here because it's a point to talk about. But I don't. I think Rich is right. Point is wasting our time obsessing over it. Let's just sort of. Move on and uh, and hope that the club have got a bit more thought behind the, the, some of the decisions that they're making because it's a very lazy link, isn't it? Barini yeah. back to Sunderland, he's out of contract and we're after a forward. Oh, well, let's link them to Sunderland. Yeah, it's not going to happen this time, I don't think. You just want to say something there, Rich? Yeah, well, one thing I, I think is more interesting is the rumour uh, around uh, Rodoni from from EFC Wimbledon. Yes. And I think that that's the kind of transfer that, that we want to be seeing. And that I'm more interested in in that and the goings on around that because there has been persistent rumours and obviously they're holding out as they should for the for the for the best value that they can get. They're a fan owned club, you know. They're an example to the rest of rest of the industry really in many things that they do. And a decent transfer fee for for a player that they've developed can keep keep that club going for a couple of years. And and you know it's not going in the pockets of uh, billionaires. It's, it's uh, entirely you know fan owned initiative, and you know they've built built their own stadium off their own backs in a pretty expensive part of London. 
Um, so they're they're gonna try and get as much value out of that trans potential transfer as possible. And I'm much more interested in those kinds of things than like say somebody messaging an ex player's wife on Instagram and posting <laughs> it all over Twitter, which in itself, to be frank, is a bit off. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not exactly slick and professional where these I saw you just you want to make a point there, Gav. Yeah, well, I think the other point is as well, I think Rudoni, from what I read, is set to be their biggest ever, their record sale, effectively. The, the, mm-hmm. Rich is right. A fan-owned club, they've traditionally milled around the sort of the bottom reaches of the football league in the last sort of 10 years. I mean, if this is accurate, what I'm reading here, the biggest fee they've received was 180 grand from Chelsea for a player in 2006. Yeah. So... You you can't blame them for holding out. They they're gonna want they're gonna want top dollar for this kid. I mean, yeah. twelve goals and five assists from midfield is pretty impressive. I was looking. Um I think he played the majority of his football out on the left of midfield, sort of the left of a three, but he's versatile. He can play left midfield, right midfield, through the middle, which I think is probably where we would be recruiting him to play. Um he's different to the type of midfielder we've got. He's big. He's rangy. He scores goals, which we don't have a centre mid who really does that. I know you could see you could see a lot of that. Uh, Luke O'Neill does hit a lot of those points, but he doesn't score a great deal of goals. Um, yeah. Rodoni got twelve in League One last season. And the other thing you've got to think about is obviously there's a, there's a lot of interest in him. It's, apparently, it's not just Sunderland who who are in for this kid. Um, Huddersfield are the other team who keep getting mentioned. Huddersfield have nearly got promoted to the Premier League. So again. He's obviously got something. We we spent quite a lot of time chasing him in January and it didn't happen. We've come back to it this summer because obviously he's maintained those levels. Um, and I would be over the moon again with, with that type of signing. I think that's when people are talking about sort of, you know, Sunderland have to spend money, we have to spend money. Yeah, we have to spend money. But I would much rather say it's spent on lads under the age of 24 yeah. who've got the room to improve than spend it on a 27, 28, 29 year old player who you're going to see no return on and down the line you're ultimately going to lose money. That's not the way forward. The way forward when you when you're putting money into transfers is to pick up these bargains, either from uh, the academies of top Premier League teams or, or, or from League One, League Two sides. So yeah, yeah I, th- I think Rudoni makes sense and it'd be interesting to see where that progresses over the coming days. He's going to want his future sorted quickly, isn't he? Ultimately, yeah. he doesn't want to be, doesn't want to be Having to try and get on pre season while he's got all this milling over him, he probably wants to make that move now. So, yeah, fingers crossed we get it done. No, absolutely. And I think it's going to be a very interesting, um, you know, remainder of the transfer window because, as, as we've mentioned before, you know, there is a plan in place, they are doing things in a different way now that was long overdue. And I think we can all be quite confident that by the time we kick off against Coventry, I think we'll have the team in a much stronger shape than it's in now. Um, and that feels like a good time to end today's podcast. So, um, thanks for joining us, uh, Gavin Rich. Much appreciated as always. And uh, make sure you visit RokerReport.com. We've got plenty of material on there and we'll have plenty of material coming uh, throughout the summer. And speak to you soon. Thanks very much. Bye.